Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. I've had about 580 of these now, and if this happens to be new to you and you'd like to check out some of the previous ones, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu, uh, where you'll see them organized in several different ways. Um, this program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of batgap.com. My guest today is Dr. Daniel Brown. Um, Dan has been a clinical and forensic psychologist for almost 50 years. He has been at Harvard Medical School for almost 40 years. He has been a student of translator for and meditation master in the, the Indo-Tibetan and Bon meditation tradition for almost 50 years. He has the only Western neuroscience study identifying the brain changes in the shift from ordinary mind to awakened mind. And as usual, I've listened to many hours of Dan's other talks and interviews over the past week, and I think we're going to have an interesting conversation. Um, Dan wanted to say something in, in the beginning. Uh, he, he, he told me he has Parkinson's and it makes his face a little bit immobile, so he wanted people to know that so it didn't freak him out or something. You want to elaborate on that, any, Dan? No, it just I lost a lot of facial expression and, and, and therefore it affects my expressivity, so it's not a zombie apocalypse movie. It's, okay, we'll just that, assume that it's Buddhist serenity, okay? The mind still works. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. So, Dan, yeah, as I was listening to your um, various interviews and, and talks, you mentioned a, a particular Buddha attainment in the Buddhist tradition, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, where a master will kind of acquire the ability to function in multiple bodies at the same time on different levels and administering to, to, to people in different dimensions or something. And it kind of reminded me of you, <laughs> in a way, because of the interesting mix of professions that, you know, any one of which would have been, um, you know, full-time occupation for most people, but you have, have lived in, in several different worlds simultaneously. Um, so maybe we should start about, you know, tell us a bit more about your background and, and the kind of diversity of things you've been doing. Well, I've been a clinical psychologist for almost 50 years, and I ran for 27 years my own continuing education program. So I offered training for almost every clinical diagnosis there was. I actually spent a day, a week in the library for almost 40 years reading the outcomes literature and keeping updated on that literature. So, so for almost any clinical diagnosis, I can tell you what the best treatments are and how to go about it. And then I worked in the forensic context, mostly in cases around trauma and abuse. There are a lot of child abuse cases in the courts. I still do that. I did almost 200 priest abuse cases. Priest abuse cases, yeah. The yeah. Catholic Church has a boundary of unlimited funds to take me out as an expert. I, I did certain perverse pride in pissing off the church that much. <laughs> I was in the Royal Commission for the, in, in Australia for two years to nail the Archbishop for the cover-up of the, of the cases there. I remember hearing that on the news, so you were involved in that, huh? I was involved in most of the cases that are in the movie Spotlight. Oh, yeah, Boston. yeah. That was a great movie. Um, has there been anything like that in the Buddhist world? Um, or, And if not, how is it that, what is it about the way the Buddhists conduct themselves that... Um, the Buddhists are just as vulnerable to sexual misconduct around the issue of monasticism. So it's just about as common over there? Well, I think what happens is you have a monastic tradition where people have the celibate, and they come to the West for the first time, and they have no preparation for dealing with relationships and sexuality. Right. And a lot of them lose it. And how about in the East? I mean, the monasteries have young, you know, people in them, and older monks, and so on. Is there a similar kind of problem? It's less frequent, but it's still a particular problem. Huh. Is there something about the Buddhist training in ethics or some such thing, or the Buddha, or the techniques for managing energies and attachments in the body that makes them a little bit less susceptible? 
No, I think it's a trouble in both East and West. So it's kind of universal. Okay. I, my first Mutant Lama was, I really respected him because he, at the age of 80, had a relationship for 10 years with a woman who was in the late 70s. Uh-huh. And I said, why are you doing this? And he says, well, it's not time to be a monk. He said, I have to learn about why these relationships are so important to all you as Westerners. Ah. And so he was actually, he open about it? Or was, yeah, he kind of, was it clandestine? It. No, he was open about it. Okay, good. <clears throat> he said he needed to learn about relationships and why it was so important as an attachment to Westerners. Yeah. And he was in, and the woman was in her 70s. He wasn't like going after 20-year-olds or something, so. No. They had, a, they had a dear relationship together. She'd come for the weekend and spend the weekend with him. Uh-huh. That's great. Um, out of curi- just out of curiosity, if, if you had been financially self-sufficient, would you have done all the psychology work and the legal stuff, or would you have just focused on Buddhism? No, I, I'd like to do different things, so I would have focused on that. My passion is for clinical psychology and forensic psychology as much as it is for Buddhism. Uh-huh. And um, do you feel that Western psychology and Buddhism um, are each lacking something which the other possesses and could actually complement one another through a closer relationship, maybe? Yes, I think that's true. Particularly around the, in, in the Abhidhamma, which is a theory of mind in Buddhism, they say that the techniques to work with negative techniques, negative states of mind, and the techniques to work with positive states of mind complement each other, but they're not reducible to each other. So, in the West, we focus about on negative states. Psychodynamic tradition focuses on conflict, interpsychic conflict. The developmental tradition focuses on developmental deficits. The cognitive behavioral tradition focuses on maladaptive thinking and negative behaviors, maladaptive behaviors. We focus almost entirely on negative states in the West, in psychotherapy tradition. Now we have in the last 10 years, 15 years, the whole positive psychology research movement. And we're seeing that positive states are important in mental health. Yeah, I should think so. I mean, Maslow talked a lot about positive states, didn't he? And the hierarchy yes. of needs and so on. Yes. Now we're seeing that positive states are very important. In Buddhism, there's a, there's a stage where you get to you eradicate all negative states. It's called the exhaustion of all negative states. Technically, it's called Dhammadhatu exhaustion. And since those negative states mask the positive states, you get a flourishing of, depending on how you count it, 80 to 85 positive qualities all, all coming forth at once. It's called Sangha in Tibetan, the eradication of all negative states and the flourishing of all positive states. I think that has profound implications for mental health, and we're, we're studying the neurosurgery of that at the moment. Mm. We have about 31 subjects who can do that in a stable way. Who can so, manifest the positive states? Manifest the positive states and they have no negative states anymore. Huh. In an so abiding, we, stable way, you say? We were, yeah, right, in a stable way. So what we're doing is we're looking at the sangha in the laboratory, in the brain, what happens in the brain for in that, in that state. So manifesting the positive states, does that mean that they don't get angry, they don't get jealous, they don't get, you know, various negative the, the, emotions? The tendency to get angry will still come up, but it immediately erases itself, it immediately disappears. Uh-huh. Kind of like so a the, line on air or a line on water or something. Like riding on water, right. Right. So um, they, don't, they, don't, they don't register it, they don't, they don't react to it. Yeah. Some people, I mean, people have funny ideas about what enlightenment is, and I hope you and I can talk about that a lot today. Um, but, you know, I've had people argue with me, well, you know, you could be an enlightened drug drunkard, or you could be an enlightened bank robber. Or, you know, so they, they don't correlate it with um, ethics and with, with, you know, with emotional maturity and stuff like that. They just think it's some kind of... I don't know, disembodied realization that doesn't trickle into your whole relative structure. Um, would you like to comment on that? Yes, it's wrong. I, I agree. <laughs> well, the true test of realization is, uh, is the conduct, mm-hmm. how you live your life. William James, a great American psychologist, was once asked when he wrote his book on the varieties of mystical experience, how do you test the, the authenticity of a, of a mystical experience? And he said, by the fruits you shall know them. Yeah. By the fruit you shall know them. It sounds like Jesus. The only way the only way you test the realization is through conduct. Uh, yeah, I have um 
I've been studying with Swami Sarvapriyananda lately. He's uh, the head of the Vedanta Society Center in New York. And one of his favorite phrases is that you can have morality without enlightenment, but you can't have enlightenment with, without morality. That's true. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. So let's drill down on this a little bit uh, more. Um, I, 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 I think I tend to not want to use the word enlightenment because it has this sort of static superlative connotation. And I, I kind of feel like people are always, they always have the potential for further growth. But if I were to use it, I would say that it's a holistic development where, you know, all the various, like Ken Wilber's talk of lines of development, where all the various lines have, have flourished and have been fully developed in coordination with one another. Um, would you agree with that? Would you like to elaborate on it? Well, enlightenment means something very specific in Buddhism. It means the threefold embodiment of enlightenment. That always right here, there's an infinite, limitless ocean of brilliantly alert, lucid, awakened awareness, love. It's called the Dhammakaya, the embodiment of all, of all the teachings. In that vast, limitless spaciousness, the world that you perceive is sacred. There's no profane world anymore, no secular world. Everything is, and every one of deities within the mandala. So you only live in a sacred world. You don't see anything sacred, anything other than that sacred world. That's the Sambhogakaya. It's always right here. It's not Buddha fields out in some place remote you fly off to. You see them through your own eyes and always right here, all the time. So you live in that sacredness all the time. And then that plants the seed of aspiration. It breaks your heart, and most people don't see that. And that, that, that heartbreak intensifies, that you want so much for people to see that world. That, that, that intensity causes that aspiration to spread into thousands and thousands of emanation bodies, the monikayas all helping people along the path. And then when you get all three of those at once successively, first, first the Dharmakaya, the limitless expanse, then the sacredness of the world, the Sambhogakaya, and then when you get the you know, emanation bodies, the Nimanakayas, then you get all three at once, all three simultaneously. You never leave that state again. It's usually accompanied by a great deal of awe. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard you use the Heart Sutra many times in, in, in the talks I've been listening to. Why don't you tell us that, just so people... It's, it's a good point here. Well, the thing that... The first realization is about awakening. The second realization is the purification of all negative states and the flourishing positive states. The third and final realization is stable enlightenment, fruition enlightenment, it's called. It starts with awakening. And... Usually we say that the, the, the seeds for awakening are always here. But you don't recognize it. It's like the sun is always shining. But we don't recognize the sun until the clouds clear away. When the clouds clear away, we say the sun just came out. Is that true? No. The sun's always out. The sun's out shining day and night all the time. But from our perspective, we don't see it because of the clouds. So the heart sutra is about the clouds. There are four clouds. The, ch the chant in the Hatsu goes like this. Gate, gate, parada gate, parasam gate, bodhisvaha. Gate, gate, para gate, parasam gate, bodhisvaha. Gate, gate, para gate, parasam gate, bodhisvaha. Here's what it literally means. Gone. Gone. Gate, gate. Gone way beyond. Gone way, way beyond. Ooh, what a realization. So what it means is that we get caught up in our everyday life in thought, conceptual thought. We live in conceptual thought most of the time. But if you calm the mind through concentration training, you have long periods of time where there's no thought elaboration. And then you realize that you're operating where you're operating out of, if not thought. You're operating out of the field of awareness rather than out of thought. So we learn to operate out of the field of awareness. We learn to make that our basis of operation. That's the first thing. 
then you learn, you learn that you, you're caught up in a sense of self all day long. I get caught up in Dan. This Dan becomes a sense of organizing principle in my life. But if I do emptiness of self, I go beyond Dan. I don't get rid of Dan. But Dan becomes part of the field, but I step out of that. Caught, caught up in Dan. This I don't make Dan my upper my basis of operation. Instead, I see that I'm operating out of the field of awareness, cleaned up of Dan. That's the second God day. Awareness gone beyond self-representation to the field of awareness is my basis of operation. Then I get caught up in time. Things seem to come and go in the field of awareness. But if you look at the entirety of that field, the field doesn't change at all. It's timeless and changeless. But I can step out of that field of awareness, out of the convention of time, go beyond it to a, a field of awareness that's timeless, changeless, and boundless. It's huge time and space related to change to that, what we call simultaneous mind. It's limitless, ocean-like awareness. It's absolutely timeless and changes and non-dual. That becomes the foundation. That's the third. And that, that, that's a much bigger change. When I operate out of that bigger field of awareness and everyone is contained and in, in, interconnected within that field, and we all influence each other, when I appreciate that directors of realization, then... I've moved on to simultaneous mind, which is the foundation of Mahayana Buddhism. That's the third, that's the third gate, the third cloud, the time and space. And the fourth cloud is our localization of consciousness and the operations of our information processing system. It's like a video code that you have to figure out. My information processing system is set up so that I don't realize this unbounded wholeness is always right here because I get caught up in partializing Every time I conceptualize about something, if I conceptualize about this, it's not about that. I can't realize that I can't think my way into into awakening because it's means becoming the unbound wholeness. I'm making it my basis of operation. So as soon as I conceptualize about this, I miss it. As soon as I focus in my mind on something and pay attention to something and focus on this, I'm not focusing on that. So I can't realize the unbound wholeness by paying attention in any way or engaging in any meditation strategy. But if I set up a, what we call automatic emptiness, so everything that arises, every residual tendency to conceptualize is immediately empty upon arising. Every residual can attempt to strategize about meditation is immediately empty upon arising. I can move beyond all that. And I can realize that my wholeness is always right here. Then there's one final thing, the tendency to localize consciousness. In that, sometimes, when I set up a certain view with the right instructions, I can move beyond that, the localization, the tendency of the mind towards something that makes something particular. I can move beyond all that to become the unbounded wholeness. Then I realize awakened awareness right here. That's all the time. So it starts with a practice called Ocean of Ways where you, you have beyond time and space the view then you stabilize that as what's called a natural state, and then you have automatic emptiness, so you can clear clear away all the residual conceptualization and all kinds of doing. And then you set up a certain view where you take the unbound wholeness, the orient awareness towards the unbound wholeness, and hold it every moment by moment. And this it shifts your base of operation out of the ordinary mind to awakened mind. We did a study on that with Judd Brewer when he was at UMass Medical School. And what we found was that we had three meditation conditions, ocean and waves, the stabilization of the natural state, and the adoption of the particular view called lion's gaze, the shift from ordinary mind to awakened mind. And then fourth was stable awakening. In the first three meditation conditions, we had activation of the uh, anterior cingulate cortex, which is the center of deep concentration, focus on one thing and turn everything else out. So we interpreted that as holding the view, but what the unusual finding was that we had gamma activity in all the subjects in, the, in that study, which means that in the, in the interior cingulate cortex, what's happening is that all the cells are firing are syn- syn- synchronistically. They're all in line. So awake means awake for that part of the brain. Now we, we interpreted that as holding the view very intensely and very stably. Once they had learned to do that, then the fourth stage they shifted to awakened awareness and they activated an area of the parietal system which is usually associated with 
shifting from a more localized awareness to a more global awareness. And they had gamma activity for all subjects. So awake means awake for that part of the brain. They shifted to a out of a localized consciousness to the becoming the unbounded wholeness, this ocean-like, boundless, limitless, lucidly awakened awareness love. And that's what we found with awakening, consistent with what the texts say. And usually we'll find get gamma, act, gamma activity in that area, in that region of interest. We got it in all subjects. So awake means awake, but not for the whole brain. The area of global awareness is limitless, boundless, lucidly knowing, brilliantly awareness, awake and awareness, love. That's what you open up. Now what we're trying to do a study on Sange, also with Judd Brewer. He's now at Brown University, you know, sponsored by the FEDSA Foundation. We have identified 31 subjects who have completely purified all negative states. They've, they've manifested all the flourishing for the positive states. And they live in the perceive a sacred world all the time now. And I think that what we're going to see is activation of the gamma activity in the medial orbital prefrontal cortex, which is the positivity center of the brain and the social connection center of the brain. And we're, I think we're going to find that working hypothesis. We're going to find gamma activity in that area of the brain. I have about six points written down from what you've just said of things I want to go into more deeply with you. Um, First of all, this, you know, this emphasis on trying to correlate subjective states with brain activity, I think, is fascinating um, because obviously, you know, brain activity changes significantly whenever our subjective experiences change significantly. You know, waking, dreaming, and sleeping are obvious examples. Brain activity is different, and um, you would think, and it should be that. Enlightenment being as radically different a state of experience as it's purported to be would be correlated with a radically <clears throat> different style of brain functioning. And it'll be interesting to see as time goes on um, how carefully um, defined that can become and you know how, how identifiable it can be such that we could even eventually expect to find some kind of neurophysiological um, you know, test for higher states of consciousness or for, well, we or for enlightenment. With enlightenment. We have two subjects who have a stable fruition enlightenment, two subjects who have unstable path enlightenment, and we're going to bring them into the lab and see what the brain is doing. So, but the trouble is the pandemic has shut the lab down, so we're waiting to the, for the lab to open up beyond the pandemic. So we're delayed in our research findings because of that. Well, it'll happen. Um, Another point I wanted that you mentioned I wanted to dig into a little deeper is you know seeing the world as sacred. Uh, I, I have an understanding in my from my orientation of what that means and and you know some degree of experience of it. Although I'm sure it could be much more profound. Um, but what do you maybe you could elaborate on what you mean by it and what the subjective experience of someone who sees the world as sacred would be as compared to people's or, ordinary experience. Okay, I have to introduce a little background here. But in, in the Tibetan theory of mind, there are six sense systems. We have five in the West. The, the visual perception, auditory perception, the smells, taste, body sensations. Those are the five senses. In the theory of mind in Tibet, there are six sense systems. There's what's called the Yishe, the mind perceiver, the mind consciousness. And we use conceptualization to interpret sense data. So if I hold up my calendar here, I see color and form with the eyes. But if I integrate that with the mind consciousness, I see a calendar. And there's lots of written things on it. The difference is that we ordinarily use conceptualization to interpret sense experience. And that's called true in Tibetan diluted perception. It's just wrong. We don't see the masks are seeing the sacredness of the world. And if I purify all karmic memory traces, the outcome of that is I purify the, my perception so I don't see it through conceptualization anymore. I just see it through the, through the pure sense systems. 
and therefore I start seeing the world as more and more sacred. But you're still yeah. going to know it's a calendar because you couldn't function if you couldn't identify the the you know mundane function of things, right? You no, know, you start seeing the world as more and more sacred. So after a while, it's purely sacred. Can't you have both? It's like, you know, you're seeing the yes. sacred quality of the calendar, but you also, if someone says, you know... At very advanced stages, you, you, know, you, know, you know, the conceptualization doesn't delude perception anymore. And you can still operate simultaneously out of the, the calendar perception and the sacred perception simultaneously. That's yeah, true. You'd have to, to function. I mean, yes. you know police pulls you over and says license and registration and you, you say sorry it's all sacred i can't see, i don't know what those are you'd be in trouble <laughs> well that's true but it's same with sense of self in in the older buddhism theravada buddhism the sense of self was one of the three realizations was anatta no self and if you look at burmese mindfulness there are four studies that show that the medial prefrontal cortex which is sense of self in my case danness the felt sense of damnness goes offline in that kind of practices. It's the first level of Buddhism. But in Mahayana Buddhism, it doesn't go offline. It's just, it, it, it recedes into the field and you become the field. So you have this ocean-like, timeless, boundless awareness. And then Dan is still there as part of the field. It's like a wave in the ocean. But you operate under being an unbounded wholeness. So we call that shifting your basis of operation, sure you're in Tibetan, or where, where you're operating out of, where you're coming from. So you can, you can operate out of the field itself and, and become that field. But if you, in advanced stage, you can become that field in a way that you can also become Dan at the same time. And there's no contradiction. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I've had conversations with people who insist that they've lost their sense of self altogether, and I don't know how they would function, you know. But it's like, you know, the wave can say, yeah, I realize I'm an ocean, but I'm, I'm also a wave, and there's no conflict be, in terms no conflict. of being both. No, once you open up the, that stable perception, there's no conflict anymore. You can have the sense of self come and go, and it doesn't, it doesn't interfere with your perception of the sacred world. Yeah. It's always right here. So would you say the sense of self is like a faculty, the way, you know, seeing is a faculty, and, and it doesn't necessarily occlude your universal nature if you're properly realized? Well, for most of us, it becomes a central organizing principle in our daily life, so it's useful. Yeah, yeah. Relative reality, so we don't get rid of it in that sense. But you don't, you're, not, you're not blind to it, you're not caught up in it. Right, so it's not overshadowing. Um, okay. I can't even read some of my own scribbles here. Um, <laughs> all right. So one of the conditions for enlightenment that you itemized a few minutes ago was this development of multiple bodies um, simultaneously serving in different functions in different dimensions. So would you say that, I mean, can you give us an example, like if the Dalai Lama, for instance, is supposed to be enlightened, um, is he somehow, we, we see his obvious body, but is he subjectively experiencing himself having other bodies that are doing things in other... Well, he's an emanation of Chen Rezi. He's the Buddha of compassion, Avalokiteshvara. So he is Avalokiteshvara in this lifetime. He's the embodiment of compassion. Right. That Buddha of compassion. And, and, and so the thing in terms of other bodies, so are you saying that Lokateshwara, if that was the right name, Avalokiteshvara. he's just pardon. Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit and Chen Rezik in Tibetan. Avalokiteshvara. So you're just saying that the Dalai Lama is one of Avalokiteshvara's many emanations uh, that are functioning simultaneously. Is no, that what you're saying? He's, saying? he's Avalokiteshvara. He is Avalokiteshvara. If okay. you are fully enlightened, you can live in an awakened Dharmakaya space forever, and then you can intend yourself to take a certain form in a certain plane of reality to teach or to manifest you know, all the certain teachings. So he's intended to manifest himself as Avalokiteshvara. Okay. Necessary for this given time in history. So that's what he does. And so is he, is he doing other things simultaneously in other bodies, or is it more like one body at a time you do different things? Probably. probably. Okay. You, you never talked to him about that? Never talked to him about that, no. All righty. Um, 
Just curious. They don't talk about attainments very much. You know, they, it, 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 for, for the not getting into spiritual pride, they don't talk about attainments much. Right, yeah. They don't want to toot their horn. Um, we just did a, one, once years ago, we did a study on the speed of the mind with a statistical. We were in, in the Dalai Lama supplied us his best meditators for that. Uh-huh. We couldn't ask them about attainment. He had to say we had to imply a certain state and they would do it for us. And we couldn't ask them about it. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of speed of the mind, um, I don't want to get us off track because I still have a few catch-up points from the, what we've discussed so far. But I heard you tell a story about a baseball player who trained himself by having tennis balls fired at uh, across the plate at 150 miles an hour, which obviously he couldn't hit. But it made him a, a much better baseball player when softball, when hard balls were pitched at normal, you know, 95 mile an hour speeds. What's the teaching in that? The teaching is that we confuse three things in our ordinary consciousness. We confuse thinking and paying attention and the, the intention of awareness. We see them all as thinking. But if you learn to separate them out, thinking is slow. So thinking takes about 500 milliseconds to about 300,000 milliseconds, which is mean three seconds to a, a, half, a half a second to think, have a thought. Paying attention is about 400 milliseconds or somewhere between three, three and 400 milliseconds. And you can get paying attention down to 200 milliseconds. But anything less than 200 milliseconds is the intention of awareness. So Tony Gwynn trained himself, to, uh, stood at, he stood at his batting cage and he would have tennis balls to come in at 200 miles an hour. He couldn't hit them, but he could. But if if he if he trained himself to operate not out of thinking, not out of paying attention, but just the field operating out of the field of awareness, he could still see the position where the ball came in space at very high speeds. But if he was operating out of thinking, he wouldn't hit the ball. He couldn't see it. So he trained himself to operate out of that field of awareness, and he hit for the second high, highest batting average other than Ted Williams over his career. So he trained himself to operate out of awareness. Did he have an actual Buddhist orientation, or did he just kind of no. get onto this trick through... He got onto it by lobbing in tennis balls at 150, 200 miles an hour. Interesting. And so how long does it take a fastball to get to the plate from the pitcher's hand? 400 milliseconds. How many? 400 milliseconds. 400. And, and, and you said thought is about 500 or so? Thought is about 500. So if you're thinking, you can't see the fastball. Can't do it, right. But if you're paying attention, you can still see it. Right, because that could be as fast as 200 milliseconds, you said. But if you're operating at a lightning speed of awareness, you're going to see it every time. Huh. So that's what he trained himself to do. Interesting. <clears throat> okay. Um, back to the sense of self. Um, I've had some people say to me, well, reincarnation couldn't be a thing because ultimately there is no person and reincarnation implies that there is some kind of person or entity or subtle body or something which would reincarnate. Um, but the talk in Buddhism, as I've heard it, and most recently from you, seems to imply that there is some kind of sense of self, and you and I were just talking about that. It's, it, it's not ultimately what you are, but it's a, it's a function, a relative function, and, you know, and therefore there could be reincarnation and it's actually like you said the Dalai Lama is the emanation of Avalokiteshvara um, so there's some kind of you know essence or entity of Avalokiteshvara that is now embodied in the Dalai Lama and that survived long after Avalokiteshvara's physical body on earth died um, so it seems to me that in Buddhism, as I understand it, which is obviously a very limited understanding, um, you know, there are these other dimensions. There is there is some kind of personal agglomeration <laughs> that we that we would call an entity or a self, and it carries on over the, you know, over time. Um, is all of that on track, or am I getting that only partially right? It's what's called an indestructible essence, which is a, a store of all the karmic memory traces over lifetimes. And then has a unique signature, like a, like a fingerprint, written uniquely for you. It doesn't include sense of self, and in my case, Danness. 
But the, the storehouse of all the memory traces goes from lifetime to lifetime. Unless you uh, purify that through the practice of sangha, and then this, you, you don't have it anymore. Then you become, upon dying, you become full, full enlightened Buddha and you exist in, in a sense of Dhammakaya space. You can intend to emanate in any forms you want. So in other words, you get voluntary control over the dying process and the reincarnation process through these practices. So if you're a highly enlightened Buddha... Um... You can come back any way you want, in any, any plane of reality, any time you want, any time in history you want. And so you don't just drop into the ocean like a, like a drop of water does and cease to exist in any way, shape, or form. There's some kind of, what did you call it? Um, indestructible. Essence. Indestructible essence, which is going to remain um, and could take another role in, later on, like you just said. But you have every, everybody is born with enlightened intention, Gongpa in Tibetan. So you can intend to, to, to emanate in any form you want, any way you want, any, any, any number of copies of yourself you want. Does everybody have this enlightened, this indestructible essence? Yes. Okay. Everybody has enlightened intention, but they don't realize it. So the average person is pretty much compelled to take a birth according to their karma, but you're saying that an enlightened person gets to pick and choose. Um, they have that there's freedom. A, there's a process by which you look at the view of the limitless expanse, and you have uninterrupted, uninterrupted liveliness of what arises within the expanse. And you do both of those views simultaneously, the expanse and the uninterrupted liveliness of what occurs in the expanse. And you look at it in such a way that you don't engage anything that comes up with just pure awareness. Mental engagement is what causes karmic memory traces to form. So if you hold this view in advanced stage of practice in the right way, then whatever comes up is released because you don't engage it. So it becomes an automatic process where you're releasing every common memory trace. And it forces the mind to get into a rapid cycle of releasing all common memory traces. It takes about seven years to do that. And then the end of the result of that is there's no negative states left. You've exhausted all the negative karmic memory traces. And because they mask the positive states, you get a flourishing of 80 to 85 positive qualities of the Buddha mind. That's what I was talking about earlier that we're studying in neuroscience of now. So, so in that, so you move beyond all karmic memory, all, all karmic influences. You've gone beyond it at that point. So I presume, I mean, I know that you, we just discussed that Buddhists don't like to proclaim anything about themselves, but you've been at this for 50 years, so perhaps we can, um, we can infer that anything you're talking about here, you're talking about from your own personal experience. Yes, and when we do the neurocircuitry, I usually come up with, because uh, I read all the neurocircuitry journals, I come up with the ideas from my own experience. And I, look at, I, I tell them what regions of interest to look at. And so the, the enlightened person's body, it's, their relative you know, structure, is still influenced by karmic memory traces, correct me if I'm wrong, but no, they're no longer gripped by it or overshadowed by it. Is that right it, or wrong? It, it, no, you exhausted the exhaust bin. It's called Dhamma Dhamma. At some point, there's no, there's no karmic memory trace anymore. It's just a flourishing of positive states. Okay, but like, let's say in your no own case, anymore. you mentioned that you... Anymore. You mentioned you have Parkinson's, and that's... Little, then when you die, you become a fully enlightened Buddha. Um, so, let's say if you have a disease or an accident or something like that, and yet you're an enlightened being, um, and you've worked out all your karmic memory traces, what is causing that disease or that accident? At some point, you move beyond even the disease. Your subjective experience is beyond it, but on the body level, you still... The body's going yeah. through it, right? You can purify all the residual substantiality of the body so that you, know, you move beyond all disease influences. Oh. So theoretically, with your Parkinson's, you could somehow purify that out and move beyond it? Is that what you're saying? If I did that practice enough, I would do that, yes. Uh-huh. Well, that's interesting. Um, what, what's the success rate of that practice, and are there examples of people having done that? I don't know the success rate of that. We haven't studied that in Western psychology yet. But there's a specific practice that you know of that you could do? 
in a fire practice with the central channels preserves this. It, it removes this residual substantiality of the physical body. And there's another practice called non-jok, which is balancing the elements in the body. And you, by balancing the elements in the body, you, you make the body healthy, so you don't get sick anymore. That's great. Is it hard to do? I mean, is it something that could be taught to people in the clinical setting if, if, our, if our culture understood that kind of thing? I've done the non enough to learn how to do it, but I haven't mastered it yet. Uh-huh. So it is kind of hard to do if you haven't mastered it. <laughs> well, it takes some time to learn these things. There's so many other things that are more important to learn, learning the other things first. Yeah, yeah, sure. Huh. Interesting. There's only so much time in the day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, let me get at a question here from somebody. Let me put my glasses on so I can read it. Um, Oh, yeah, this kind of relates to what we were just saying, I think. Um, this is from a, a fellow named Lennon in Santa Barbara, who asks, um, could you talk about your experiences with the rainbow body phenomena that occurs with Tibetan meditation adepts and how to fix the seeming lack of rainbow body with Western meditation adepts despite many devoted practitioners? In other words, I think he's saying, how come we're not seeing examples of it despite all these dedicated Western practitioners? Well, we have a book coming out on Rainbow Body. Mm -hmm. I actually translated all those texts. And maybe you should define it, because maybe not everybody knows what that is. Rainbow Body means that as you're dying, you enter into meditation while you're dying, and you clean up the substantiality, the residual substantiality of the physical body. And there's two versions of that. There's a trecho version of that, which in Dzogchen means thoroughly cutting through practice. In that sense, the body doesn't completely disappear. It has a sudden, subtle, particulate nature to it. But it's, it, it appears to others as if the body disappears. And then there's a bypassing practice, a trivial practice. There's two versions of that, which the, the, you, you clean up all the substantiality of the body right down to the, the body becoming light. So after two or three days of this practice, all that's left is a light body. So the, the, the physical body disappears. Sort of like the resurrection. Hmm. The physical body disappears and it, cha- it changes to rainbow light and the rainbow light hovers in the space above where the body, physical body was. All that's left is the hair and nails, the inanimate parts of the body. But the physical body is completely transformed into rainbow light. And then it disappears after a number of days or weeks. It disappears into the atmosphere. So the highest achievement of is to, is to use your know, dying process to, to, to resolve the substanti- residual substantiality of the physical body. That's called rainbow body. Hmm. Have you ever witnessed that happening? Um, there, when my teacher died, he, he appeared as a rainbow above his village. I've seen the film of that. Mm-hmm. And what happened to his physical body? Was it just um, cremated or something? Or? He got cremated and it turned into relics. Hmm. The other thing you can leave behind relics. Yeah, there was this um, exhibit that came around. It came to my town, and I went and saw it. And there were all these, whole, all these glass cases with all these little things in them. They looked like resin or something like that. Little bits little, and pieces. Little balls of about a millimeter in size. Yeah, brightly, brightly colored, and uh, they have an influence on physical reality. So, the the tour that you talked about, they they were studied. And they uh, they influence they, they influence decay rate of radioactive material. They they can activate enzymes in the test tube. They have an effect on physical reality still. And we 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 got delayed by the pandemic. But His Holiness Menry Treasing, who's my main teacher, died a year and a half ago, and he gave me his relics, and we're studying them in the laboratory. And we we're trying to find out whether they what they're made of, and whether they're made of something on the periodic table, or whether they're made of some known under substance that we don't know. We're waiting to analyze the relics now. And these relics showed up in the ashes of of cremated bodies, or or yes, they show up in the ashes of the cremated bodies. Okay, and you just don't see them in ordinary cremations, right? No, you don't see them in ordinary cremations. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Um, that's called rainbow body, or, or either either the manifestation of the body as pure light, as seen by others, or the manifestation of relics. Yeah. One or both. Um, relics are 
for less capacity people who are, need, need to have faith so that the master leaves something behind for them. Yeah, so you've mentioned the pandemic several times, and obviously that has a lot of ramifications and influences, but um, you, so you're, you're still doing some online retreats despite the pandemic. Yes. We were retreat in London that we couldn't do because we, we couldn't travel there, so we had to do it in, online. How'd that work out? It worked out well. Good. We did a level two course online for a week, and we did a level one, the beginning course, online for a week. Just, we should just finish that. I have a hard time doing things like that because there's always so much going on around here, you know? I mean, compared to getting away and... Well, we have morning and afternoon classes for a week. It's an intensive course. And we just do it online. I heard you say an interesting thing, actually. This would be kind of fun to get into. Uh, you, you're a little bit... Um, not too enthusiastic about silent retreats. And I heard you give a riff where you were talking about sort of the how the seven deadly sins and maybe an eighth one kind of tend to bubble up during silent retreats. Um, you want to talk about that? Sure. It was uh, a list put together by Johannes Cassian in the early Christian Desert Fathers, the movement that lasted from about 50 AD to about 250 AD, about 200 years. And there was a time when the Desert Fathers, were, people were going, leaving the church and going and study with the Desert Fathers, so the church was threatened by that. So they decided to send out uh, Lucidus Pladius to study, to study with the Desert Fathers. It was the sole purpose to debunk them. He lived with them for two years, and he wrote uh, something that reads like A Course in Miracles. It, it, it's all about people flying through the air and... And the church was terribly embarrassed by that, so they suppressed the publication of his book. You mean he, went, w he witnessed people flying through the air and wrote about it? Is that what yeah, you wrote about it. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. It's all about miracles, raising people from the dead, things like that. So he was supposed to debunk them, but he ended up <laughs> boosting Correct. them up more. And then, and then they brought him the second bishop, whose name was Johannes Cassianus, or Cassian for short. And he lived with them for two years. Thank you. And he didn't debunk them also. He wrote two books. One is called The Institutes. And in The Institutes, he said that if you did these practices like the prayer of quiet, you became Jesus. So the church was terribly threatened by that theology. And they redacted his book. They actually rewrote the ending, the conclusion of his book for him, and said that he didn't become Jesus, he became an archangel. So they preserved the historical figure that way. But he also wrote a second book, which is about the seven deadly sins, or eight deadly sins, depending on how you count them. And he said that he, he, he thought that the, the times of extreme social and, and, and sensory isolation was actually harmful to the meditation. He was critical of the Desert Fathers in that. So the first one is gluttony. You can understand that if you go camping for the weekend. What do you spend if you go camping, for, take your kids camping for the weekend? You spend the entire time preparing food and cooking food and cleaning up after, and then preparing food again and cooking food and cleaning up after. When a certain version of that, you turn out the lights in the theater and you reach for the popcorn. So if you, if you, if you seriously shift your, the busyness of your sensory overload of everyday life in terms of drastically reducing your sensory output, then it plays out around food. That's the third deadly sin. The second is what he calls lust. We used to see that when we did outcome studies. We, I did, as a psychologist, I did 10 years of outcome studies on Burmese mindfulness. And in the late 1970s and 1980s, we did that research. When IMS, the Insight Meditation Society, was first popular with three months retreats. So we go up the first day and we get a captive audience and we test and do some outcome measure and then we go three, three months later that he came out of the retreat. So we, we studied those subjects for 10 years. All sorts of different studies from cold pressure pain to high speed information processing with a T-scope to lots of different things. Different personality questionnaires, things like that. And what we found was that that um, that a lot of them, in the, the extreme isolation for not talking for three months was difficult on them. So there was a thing called the Vipassana romance, 
which is equivalent to Cassian's lust. In the third week of the retreat, and you're isolating yourself and not talking to anybody, you have all these fantasies about the love of your life and sitting three pillows away. And it goes on and on like that. And you spin out in these fantasies because you're lonely. And it interferes with the meditation. The third is anger. If you keep isolating yourself, you get pissed off and depressed. And the fourth is agitation of mind. The fifth is drowsiness of mind. And the next one is no self or selflessness or pride. And you start, if you really continue to do, on the meditation, the problem of who's doing the meditation comes up. Whether it's Dan in my case, or whether it's the awareness doing the meditation. So those are those are the seven deadly sins. And then there's an eighth one that's reserved just for people who have spiritually advanced, and you call it spiritual pride. And the further along you get the practice, the more that's a problem, rather than less of a problem. I like that system. So what he did is he identified, Cassian identified the problems of extreme social and social and sexual, uh, social and, and sensory isolation, and the, and how that interferes with meditation. We don't do silent retreats. We have people talk in the breaks and. Uh, and we put the emphasis on doing emptiness practice in everyday life so that we take it off the pillow right from the beginning. So it, we don't emphasize the extremes of, of social isolation. I did, as a psychologist, I did research on sensory isolation earlier in my career. So we knew the negative effects of that. You dismantle the perceptual system. It doesn't do anything useful except destabilize you. Mm. Yeah, I can vouch for that. I mean, I was on some long courses, six months at a time, and sometimes it went fine, even though we had like... You know, you take a walk after lunch and talk with your friends and all that stuff. But other times, uh, I fell prey to quite a few of those different, um, you know, things that you just itemized. Um, your mind just gets into a state, you know, where the when there's yeah. A, yeah. Hmm. Um, so it may seem glamorous to do a silent retreat for months and months, but it, it actually has some negative side effects. Yeah, and you hear about these cave yogis that get locked in a cave and, you know, food is handed through a little slot in the door and all that stuff. I, I think, you know, I don't know if anybody in contemporary has ever done that successfully, but the vast majority, I think, would just go stark raving mad if they tried it. I had a Lama, Mahamudra Lama, that, that I studied with it. He spent 40 years in his isolation in this cave wow. before he came out. How did he turn out? Well, he came out at the age of 87. He had cancer. and He went to the Dalai Lama and said, I think I, I have cancer now. So I'm um, teaching. Dalai Lama said, I need to stay around. I need you to be 100 years old and teach until you're 100. So he did that. Huh. Just, so it worked for him. It worked for him. Yeah. Um, there's a... Uh, a a, f a quote that I've used a lot of times, uh, and I was told that it can't, comes from Tibetan Buddhism, and may, if it does, you will have heard it, and if it doesn't, you can correct me, but um, it's something like, don't mistake understanding for realization. Don't mistake realization for liberation. Have you heard that one? Not in that form. Okay. We have, an, we have another one in the Bon tradition that I like a lot. So let me, let me pose another one back to you. It's not enough to, to hear the teachings, you have to listen to them. It's not enough to listen to the teachings, you have to intellectually understand them. It's not enough to intellectually understand them, you have to put them into meditation practice. It's not enough to put them into meditation practice, you have to have the realizations that are part of the practice. It's not enough to have the realizations, you have to have signs of progress that you're integrating the realizations into your mind stream. Not enough to have integration of the medita meditation experiences into your mind stream. You have to have the realizations that are appropriate for that level of practice. It's not enough to have the realizations. You have to put them into practice, integrate them into your mind stream in a stable way. It's not enough to integrate them into your mind stream in a stable way. You have to put them into practice in your conduct and how you treat people. That is a good, one of my favorite passages about, it goes from, from hearing the teachings to listening to the teachings to intellectual understanding to putting them to meditation practice to getting signs of progress in the meditation to have the meditation experiences the full range of meditation experiences to have the realization to integrate the realization stably in your mind stream 
and translating that into conduct in terms of how you can be the benefit to other beings. That's a good trajectory of what you're talking about. Yeah, that's great. It's it's more kind of a f- you know more detailed version of that quote that I was using. And the reason I was using it is that when I first started doing this interview show, I would run into people who, um, you know, kind of what they call the Neo Advaita crowd, where apparently they had read a lot of bo- read a bunch of Ramana Maharshi books and gone to some satsangs and had latched on to it. To, as far as I could tell, had latched on to an intellectual understanding of of non-duality and so on, but um, I really got the feeling it wasn't in their bones. You know, it wasn't an actual realization, and um, so I'd have these little yeah, debates with them sometimes. People conceptualize about awakening and, and not have it. Yeah, and the more you conceptualize about awakening, the further away you get from it. And yet, you can be, you can convince yourself that you have it. Yeah, we call that narcissism in the West. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it leads to self-importance and if you learn one thing in spiritual practice the main lesson is self-importance isn't terribly important <laughs> yeah are there some um, acid test kind of you know litmus test uh, earmarks of spiritual progress that one sh- that people should sort of look out for for instance I've heard you talk about maintaining unbounded awareness or vastness during sleep. Now, that, that's hard to fake, you know? Uh, and would, would you consider that to be a necessary criterion of a certain level of, of awakening or enlightenment? And, and are there others in addition to that? For every level of practice, there are what are called talks, signs of progress. And in the text, it, it describes in great detail what those signs of progress are that you look for. And that tells you that you're on the right track. But it's also true that if you master and have stability at a certain level of practice and realizations, then there are certain consequences to that, which are usually manifest in terms of one's conduct, but also in terms of how one understands the practice or what we call the realizations, the tokpa. So it, it's, there's signs of progress you look for, and then there are consequences that you look for. Both are true. And is there also a an emphasis in the tradition of um, a teacher kind of verifying or not verifying uh, any realization that a, a student claims to have had. Yes, the first thing is if you have a taste of awakening, it should move your heart. So it's usually accompanied by compassion, gratitude, or some version of moving your heart, kindness, Secondly, if you have a taste of awakening, is Rahab Toko, who I used to teach with, who died last year. He was an emanation of Padmasambhava. He says that if you have a realization and it's, and it's purely conceptual, it will fall apart in difficult circumstances. But if, you, if your realization deepens in difficult life circumstances, then it's probably genuine. And the third test, and the only true test for realization, is conduct. It's how you live your life and how you be with other people and how you treat other people. That's the only true test of realization, in my opinion. That's good. Um, Well, like that Swami Sarvapriyananda quote that I gave earlier, I mean, there there are some people who conduct themselves very well in the world and are very kind and compassionate and generous and so on and so forth who aren't necessarily realized. But what I think what you're saying is that if you are realized, then that kind of behavior is... Um, you are necessarily that way. You're right, right. Yeah. Okay, a question just came in from Barbara in Portugal, um, and this relates to what I was just saying about witnessing sleep. She said, um, would it be possible to ask Dan about thoughts on witnessing? So maybe there's a number of different implications of that term, and we could talk about it for a few minutes. In Tibetan, it's called shazing, or we call it metacognitive awareness. So, for example, in in concentration training, you in neuroscience terms, you train the ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex. That's the center of the brain that's active in when you focus on one thing and tune everything else out and sustain that concentration, and sustain that focus in a stable way. But there was a study done in Richie Davidson's lab where he looked at beginning advanced concentrators both beginning and advanced concentrators activated the ACC. 
But only the advanced concentrators activated the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, this piece here. The right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is, is metacognitive awareness. The left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is metacognitive thinking. So you can think about your state of mind and improve it, or you can just be purely aware of your state of mind and improve it. Of course, the superior mode of knowing is pure awareness of your state of mind, metacognitive awareness. So the ones who get the best back practice are the ones who train the metacognition online so that they don't just meditate. They're always improving the meditation and looking at bad habits and correcting for the bad habits and looking for the best meditation and improving it. So they're always growing and changing in the meditation in a good way. And the difference is whether you put metacognition online or not. I might need a little bit more elaboration to fully understand that myself, but in terms of... You, no, you're, you, aware of you're aware of the state of mind. You know when it's a good quality of meditation and you know how to prove it. You know when, it's, when it's, you, 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 you can identify the bad habits and not get caught up in the habits of mind. Because you're not gripped by them. You, you, you're sort of, there's a, a witnessing or a detachment from them. Is that right? Or you work with the teacher who tells you what to look for. So you can put your metacognition online along with what your teacher is telling you and you're always improving your meditation and making it better rather than getting into bad habits. As, a, as somebody who did outcome studies on Western meditators for 10 years, we saw a lot of sloppy meditators out there. People get into bad habits and don't even know they're getting bad habits. Yeah, I heard you talk about mindfulness, that, which is so popular these days, and how it's not very well supervised. And you know, maybe you could elaborate on that. Yeah, it doesn't train concentration very well. It trains a kind of an ordinary awareness of continuous presence. But one could argue that ordinary awareness actually precludes awakening. Because you, you can't you tell, you can't you confuse the difference between ordinary awareness and awakened awareness. So all that work of being mindful actually makes it harder to awaken. <laughs> and I suppose if that's true, then there aren't really any, we're not hearing about any examples of mindfulness practitioners awakening in the sense that you would define awakening. In the way it's taught in the West, it's not emphasized. Awakening isn't emphasized. So that's not even why they're getting into it. They just want to be more peaceful or whatever. Or be more, more, more continuously aware, present. So they're training ordinary awareness, not, not awakened awareness. So if you train ordinary awareness, it makes it harder to recognize the difference between awakened awareness and ordinary awareness. Well, elaborate yeah. a little bit on that difference. You have to recognize the difference between ordinary awareness and awakened awareness. There's a number of adjectives in Tibetan that talk about that. Nara, awakened awareness is intense. Dhampa, awakened awareness is sacred. Hrige, awakened awareness has sheer awakeness to it. It's awake. Trule, awakened awareness has sparkling immediacy. Ole, awakened awareness is soft and gentle. As long as you don't make these into things that you're looking for, you can use them as guidelines to recognize the difference between awakened awareness and ordinary awareness. And would it be true to say that um, awakened awareness is not, if it's genuine and if it's stable, then it's not something you have to hang on to through some force of will or something. It's just kind of your default mode of functioning. It's a, it's a natural continuum and it, it, it well, exhibits these it, qualities yeah. you just mentioned. Once you open a pathway to awakening, it changes everything. It moves your heart. Yeah. But then it, it's unstable, so it doesn't last. So then you have to set up the view. So to shift to ordinary mind, from, from ordinary mind to awakened mind, frequently, for longer duration, and more and more immediately. And you do that until you have it almost all the time on the pillow. Then you take it off the pillow, and you, you, when you, have, you shift to ordinary mind to awakened mind on the pillow. You get up and you walk around in nature. And you mix it into into daily activities eventually you mix it into when you're conversing with people then eventually you mix it into when you're thinking so you mix into all the activities and then you have it now all the time day and off the pillow on the pillow it's not no different you have it all the time then you mix it into deep sleep and dreams now you have it all the time 24 7 so having it mixed into all those different you know increasingly uh, challenging forms of activity is is that really a, a willful process at every stage of the way or is it kind of a natural stabilization that occurs intentional process it's an intentional process okay not willful intentional what's the difference 
what comes from sense of self? Dan's trying to make something happen. In, the intention of awareness comes from the field of awareness. It's part of it. Uh, yeah, a little dog incident here. Hang on. <laughs> okay, you, the dogs are gone. You can continue. I finished what I was going to say. Oh, okay, good. Um, so let's dig into that a little bit. So um, when I hear concentration, what comes to my mind is a sort of a an effort. You know, it's like, I mean, I've actually heard descriptions of meditation where you're advised to just sort of clench your teeth and just, you know, not allow thoughts to arise or whatever. And that, that's not something I would want to undertake and never have. Um, but there's also sort of a much subtler ways of, perhaps interpreting that word. Um, there's a verse in the Vedas someplace which says, be easy to us with gentle effort. And, you know, gentle effort, I suppose, could be thought of as a form of concentration where you're not just sort of sitting there daydreaming, but you're th there's an intention to, you know, keep the awareness where you, you want to keep it. Um, so could you elaborate a bit about what you actually mean by concentration and how sure. effortful or, or effortless it, it is? The goal of concentration is in Tibetan laser drum were to make the mind serviceable. It means that whatever you focus on, the mind stays on that for as long as you want it to stay on it with no interference and it just does what you accomplish. That's the, the, the nine stages, nine stages of concentration. So when you concentrate, you focus on one thing and you tune everything else out. At first it takes effort. How much effort? Well, there are two tools you use. Or three tools. The first tool is steering the mind, semtan. So if I'm focusing on the rising and falling of the breath, for example, either I'm focusing on the rising and falling of the breath and I'm turning the mind towards the rising and falling of the breath as a concentration object, or it's chasing after something else, chasing after sense experience or thought. So I keep turning the mind away from the, from the sensory experience of distracting thought back to the concentration object so it stays longer and longer on that object. That's the first tool. The second tool is called Trimpa, which we translate as intensifying. But it doesn't mean just, <clears throat> it doesn't mean like that. It means more intimately engaging the object so that you notice all the subtle detail that would otherwise go unnoticed. So when my kids were young, I took them once to Yosemite. We were standing on the edge of a field and way across the field, I said, look, there's a bear. And they looked and they looked and said, oh, yeah. Whatever they were doing, when I said, look, there's a bear, that's intensifying. They looked more closely so the subtle detail that they wouldn't otherwise notice, it became in, they became intimately engaged with all that subtle detail. So it's not so much putting in more effort. It's, it's looking in a way that you pick up the subtlety that you wouldn't otherwise notice. It, we call it intimately engaged in the detail. That's what that's what that's the key to deep concentration. Kind of a fine tuning. But then there's a certain point where the concentration gets automatic. Using our car analogy, it becomes concentration cruise control. And all the variability in the concentration drops off and it stays in a steady state and in every moment you stay you stay concentrated. And it unfolds in a nice orderly way. And then eventually, whatever the mind is focused on, it stays on that. So, and that's when thought elaboration drops off mostly. So you have long periods of time, there's no thinking going on. So that you, you back your way into seeing that where you're operating out of isn't thought anymore. You've calm thought enough that you're operating out of the field of awareness. You're operating out of the intention of that awareness. And that's when you get the first sense of what it means to have a a mind that's serviceable. Whatever the mind's awareness intends, it does just that with no interference and with lightning speed. And you learn to operate out of the intention of awareness. Why is that important? Because then you can go on to see how the mind constructs experience. If I went into a... We teach in Australia every year, and I love the outback. We go every year. Except this last year, we, we were on the tarmac, we were ready to go to Australia, and they turned the plane around, and we got canceled in March. So, because of the pandemic. But if I went to a, uh, look at the rock art, and I went by myself, and I held up a torch in the cave, and the torch was flickering, 
I wouldn't see as very much of the detail. But if I went with a stable torch, I'd see the entire wall illuminated and all the rock art. I'd see everything about it. So concentration stabilizes our point of view. So we can hold the view. We can say the view is the meditation. The view is the meditation. I learned to take a certain perspective and open up what it means to go beyond thought, what it means to go beyond sense of self, what it means to go beyond ordinary convention of time, what it means to go beyond localization of consciousness, like the Heart Sutra. And I end up with awakened awareness that way. So concentration is the tool that gets me started on this stuff. But it gets, if you can concentrate long enough, it gets easy. It's not a hard work. Whatever the mind intends, it just does that. That's what we call making the mind serviceable. Or we're making the mind pliant. It's chasing in Tibetan. I was once taught that it's natural for the mind to wander because it's looking for greater happiness, but it doesn't generally find happiness in the places most people's minds look. And so the wandering is kind of incessant and, and you know, in, and continuous. Uh, but that if the mind could be allowed to begin to turn within, then it begins to find sort of the genuine happiness that exists deep within Ananda, you know, and uh, and it will do so, it will go in that direction effortlessly if it has the opportunity to do so. Do you agree with any of that? Or? I agree with that, except that the, the, the wandering mind is, is something that needs to be trained. We say the mind is like a wild elephant, and it runs, chases after sense experience and thought most of the time. So you have to train it out of chasing after those distractions. You have to discipline the mind and train it. So that once you have the full strength and the intelligence, the elephant might working for you rather than against you. Right, but you could try chaining the elephant to a tree, or you could just provide a big pile of elephant food, and then without even restraint, the elephant will stay with the food. That's what concentration is. You usually say they tie the rope of concentration onto a certain object, and every time it wanders somewhere else, you pull it back. You pull it back or steer it. Isn't that a car analogy? And, and the cumulative effect of steering it many, many times over is it stays on the object for longer periods of time and stays completely on the object and continuously on the object. And the, the, the consequence of that is thought elaboration starts to wind down and eventually stops. So that's how concentration works. So concentration doesn't use the elephant food approach. It, it rather uses the, the tie it up and pull it tie back it up. approach. Tie it up, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, all righty. There's a couple of questions that came in. And when you go on to the insight practices, the view is the meditation. So there's a whole series of views you take for every level of practice. You have to hold them in a stable way. If you don't have a concentration background, you fall out of the view easily. It's not stable. Mm. So it gives you that stability, like when you're holding the torch and you can see the entire wall and the rock art in the cave. It, it, the concentration is the light that allows you to see it in a stable way by holding the view stably. Yeah. Um, a question came in from Dan in London. He, Dan asks, um, could you please ask uh, Dan Brown to expand a little on the process of releasing memory traces <laughs> and mental concepts from the mind? When you have awakening, you have a, your, your basis of operation becomes this limitless, boundless ocean of awareness. That's, your, that's the first view we call it, the view of the expanse. After you have that stably, the mind shifts from the ground aspect of awakening to the appearance aspect of awakening. So the view becomes, you become more interested naturally in what, what arises within that expanse. So everything that arises is what we call the liveliness of awakened awareness. All thought is lively awakened awareness. All emotions are lively awakened awareness. All, all sights, sights, all sounds, the body, body sensations, it's all lively awakened awareness. So it's a continuous, uninterrupted flow of lively awakened awareness. And you master that view. Thirdly, you master both views simultaneously. The limitless expanse and the uninterrupted liveliness of what arises in that expanse. That's the third view you take. And the fourth view is to do that without mentally engaging anything. You let it be there in pure awareness, without moving towards it to make more of it, without moving less to make less of it. You just let it be there in the shield of that expanse. And then no reactivity, no, no going towards it, no going away from it. And if you don't mentally engage it, that's what causes karmic memory traces. <coughs> if you set that up as a stable view, 
one impression I've gotten from listening to you, um, you know, over the past week okay. is that, it. I'm sorry, go, you know, finish your thought? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. If you set that up as a stable view, it starts an automatic process of Dharmakaya release. So whatever arises in the field, if you don't engage it every moment by moment by moment, it disappears. And it takes about seven years to reduce and release all common memory traces from the storehouse mind. You can accelerate that process by doing the inner fire practice with the central channel and by doing the bypassing visions practice and get the whole thing down to about two years. And that's the maximum time it takes to do this. And then you have what we call sangha, the complete purification of negative states and the flourishing of all positive states. Depending on how you count, there are about 80, 85 positive qualities that come out at once. That's what we're now studying in the laboratory in the neuroscience of sangha. They probably come out incrementally, right? Not not all of a sudden darkness to to full noon brightness, but just sort of a gradual. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. One impression that I've that I get in in listening to all this and listening to you over the past week is that there's in this tradition, these traditions that you are expert in, there are so many different practices. I mean, it kind of sounds complicated to my simple mind, you know, it's like, how would you possibly keep them all straight and know what to do and master them all? And um, is it is it simpler than I've kind of gotten? No, well, there are many practices and there, there, but some are more important than others. About six years ago, I was working with my, my teacher, my root lama, his home is Menry Treesing, who's the lineage holder for all the bond teachings, the indigenous Solchen teachings. And he brought out a text of Shards of Rinpoche's work. And it's, it's in 17 volumes, it's collected works. He pulled out two volumes and said, these are all the secret cave and hermitage yogi texts, the most advanced practices. And he says, I have a favor to ask you. All these practices that very few people can do anymore. They're going to all die out in this generation alone. And I want you to translate them and put them in a form that you can teach for Westerners. Would you do that? What am I going to do? Say, no, I don't feel like it. <laughs> so I cut down my, my teaching and my clinical... I suspended my clinical teachings for three years. And started, 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 started seeing patients for three years, or four years almost. And we, we published eight books of translations to preserve all this stuff. And it's all in one book. It's called The Self-Arising Threefold Embodiment of Enlightenment. And that contains 11 texts of the most advanced cave, cave and hermitage yogi teachings so we can preserve them in the West. Some of those we now teach, like the inner fire practice and the bypassing visions practice. We now teach those in the balancing the elements practice that I talked about earlier. So we're trying to, we're trying to preserve all of these in the West and so they continue. And so do we need so many practices? There must be hundreds of them all together because there are so Some many are parts. Others. Some are more important than others. So in, in the limited time I have left in this lifetime, I've made choices about what best, best to preserve. Mm -hmm. So what, how numerous are the most important ones? Are we talking about a dozen or a hundred? Yeah, less, or? less than a dozen. Less than a dozen. Okay. So it's not unmanageable for the average person. They could find among those dozen something that would be appropriate for them at their stage of development. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Right. Good. Um, here's a question. Uh, incidentally, as we talk along, if there's anything that comes to your mind that I'm not asking and you want to just say it, just start in on it and I will we'll do it. Um, but here's a question that comes from Michael in Oregon. He's saying, how effective or important are traditional Tibetan, um, I, I don't know if I can pronounce this, not, Gondro. Foundation. Nundro. How is it pronounced? Nundro. Preliminary practices. Okay. How effective or important are these um, for Western students? What do you recommend for a Western student who wishes to be more committed to Dharma practice but cannot afford the typical cost of Western Dharma retreats and or programs? So there's two questions there, really. So there's two questions. The first question is about doing the 100,000 preliminary practices. It takes about two or three years. I don't favor that. With my, with my teachers, I worked out a different arrangement. And then what we did is for every beginning course, there's no eligibility requirements for the level one course. 
But if anything beyond that, level two up to all the level three courses and level four courses that we have, there is a specific eligibility requirements. And then we do those instead of the Nundro. So for the level two, they have to have a certain kind of con- skill and concentration because we teach Mahamudra concentration. And, and the concentration, if, if you don't have a good background in concentration, it deteriorates rather rapidly when you do Mahamudra, Mahamudra concentration. So each course has a certain eligibility requirements for the 3A course, which stabilizes awakening. It's all the teaching on stabilizing awakening. You have to have a taste of awakening. So the courses are not something you just sign up for. You have to have a relationship with a teacher in our tradition. And, and the teacher's call is about who's eligible for a certain course. So by working out these very careful eligibility requirements for all levels of courses, the Tibetans were satisfied that they'll, they'll teach with me, even though we don't do a tradition 100,000 seminaries. At least some of those are more flexible, like Rahab Toku, who I teach with, and his holiness men retreating and his the lamas in the bond tradition I teach with. We they they accepted our eligibility requirements, which is somewhat West engaged. So when you s- uh, I'm sorry, when you say a hundred thousand practices, did you mean actually a hundred thousand different practices or some practice you would do a hundred thousand times? A hundred thousand times. Okay. Repetition of a thing. It's about okay. seven different things you have to do a hundred thousand times. Okay, good. It's two or three, two or three years. Yeah, but you so, don't recommend that anyway. No, we've we've made exceptions to that. Some Tibetans won't teach with us because of that, and some Tibetans are more flexible and, and agree that we've done a good job with that in terms of eligibility requirements that meet the worst there is. So that's what we've done. Yeah, I guess that raises the question about accusations of watering things down for the Westerners, you know, um, versus distilling the most practical, effective teachings in this tradition so that people actually get some benefit from it. They're both views are, they're both views are legitimate. It's well said. Uh-huh. Okay, so then his second question was um, Michael from Oregon. What do you recommend for a Western student who wishes to be more committed but cannot afford the typical cost of Dharma retreats? We offer scholarships to people who take our retreats. But they have to fill out a rather rigorous financial aid statement about what they're actually doing with their life. We're not in favor of people taking a vacation from life. We want them to have a meaningful livelihood to practice Dharma because that doesn't ever lead anywhere useful. On the other hand, if they're legitimately working on the Dharma and they have some concerns with finances, we'll help them with that. Okay, good. And since we're on this topic, before I forget, your website is um, drdanielpbrown.com. I'm showing it on the screen right now. Um, but is this, let's see, does this have to do with your... Well, this is more... Okay, that's so, my clinical work. Yeah. What, what yeah. website would they want to go to to find out more about your actual retreats and things. It's called pointingoutway.org. Pointingoutway.org. Okay, I'll link to that on, on your page on BatCap. And then if they want to learn the psychological stuff that we have made available, which is a Western equivalent of preliminary practices, there's one called attachmentproject.org. And another one is called mindonly.org. Yeah, I'm showing it and on the all, screen here. That is all emotional growth stuff. Yeah, I found that quite fascinating, even though some of the things I listened to were conversations you had with other psychologists and some of it was over my head but um it, it's it's interesting and it, it's i was impressed with the the depth of um western psychology at its best um you know i felt like it wow if that's something i had gotten into you know we uh, try to take the best of the western tradition and psychotherapy and translate it into simple visualizations that one, one can do on as westerners and, and, and do it instead yeah. That's what we put on these websites. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit more before we finish. Um, let me just... Okay, I think that's all the questions that came in so far. Um, so here's another kind of quote that I heard that I often use, and you can tell me whether it's authentic or not, but it's supposedly from Padma Sambhava, uh, who, t- who supposedly said... Although my awareness is as vast as the sky, my attention to karma is as fine as a grain of barley flour. Have you heard that one? 
Yes. And does that sound authentic? And we could elaborate a little bit on what he's actually saying there. He's saying about being mindful of your karma. Your conduct matters. In, in, in the view, when it's as vast as the expanse we talked about earlier. When you have awakened awareness and you live in that expanse all the time, and that's your basis of operation, that's when you need to focus more carefully on your conduct and live a life that's exemplary. Right, so you don't get a pass just because your awareness is vast. That doesn't mean you're going to be on autopilot, you know, perfect in your behavior. You have also have to continue to be vigilant, right? Exactly. Yeah. And those who rationalize that away are the ones that get in trouble. Indeed they do. Um, yeah, I mean, I've heard people say, well, you know, it doesn't matter what I do because I'm enlightened and, you know, therefore don't judge me. It's, you know, you're not capable of judging someone so enlightened as I, <laughs> that kind of thing. Well, that, that, that's the statement that comes entirely from self, self-importance. Yeah. It's not enlightened. There's nothing enlightened about that statement. Yeah, I actually helped to found an organization called the Association for Spiritual Integrity because there have just been so many train wrecks in the contemporary spiritual communities of teachers getting, you know, in trouble for, for the way they're behaving. It, and it, it really confuses a lot of students, you know, because they think, well, geez, this guy's supposed to be so enlightened, you know. And, and sometimes the students will think, well, maybe I'm wrong in, in judging him, you know, because who am I to say? Because he's supposed to be in this great state. And, and I think that's, they should have more confidence in their common sense and call in a spade early, a spade. In, in the early 1980s, the Dalai Lama asked me about this. And I said, set up something like what we do in, in, as a psychologist with licensing boards. You get a, re- a review of complaints come in. You have a committee who reviews the complaints and actually evaluates the evidence and makes a decision about them. He said, that's a good idea. So we helped him set it up. You did set it up? Yeah, we set it up. Oh, cool. The, Does it exist today? Still exists, yes. Oh, I'd like to know more about that. I'll email you later. Or you can even say so, something about so it now if there's a website or if, something. If the complaint comes in, the teacher, he... He'll, he'll he send it to his office and he'll investigate it. Ah. But this is just in the Buddhist world that the Dalai Lama would, ha- would have ju- jurisdiction over. Only, only Tibetan world, right? I see, yeah. Yeah, we were trying to set up something a little bit more universal, but you know, we weren't presuming to have any kind of authority or anything. Um, we wouldn't really want to, given our limited resources. But um, you know, the hope was to just kind of... Ins- create greater awareness in the general spiritual community of what is or is not appropriate. Well, our respective work has the same spirit. Yeah, yeah. One question. I have a, a friend named Dana Sawyer who actually is good friends with a Tibetan Lama that you may know. I forget his name. Um, but Dana and I have had this ongoing conversation about whether, whether there is some universal ultimate reality, which is what it is, regardless of whether or not people understand or experience it, or to, to, the, to, what, to whatever extent they experience it, versus sort of alternate ultimate realities, which doesn't make sense to me, where different paths and traditions will lead to different realizations, um, like different mountains, as opposed to different paths going up the same mountain. Do you have any thoughts on that? Both are true. Really? Huh. Same but different. My, my teachers always said same but different. So the, the configuration of enlightenment in Buddhism is different from that in, say, the Yoga Sutras. But it's, ultimately, it's all the same. Relatively, in terms of how you experience it and, and how you frame it. Because we can't get beyond perspectivism. It appears slightly different. There some, some those differences are important. Well, let me ask it this way. Um, as I understand it, enlightenment is not a thing where, you know, the individual is now perceiving some reality and you still have this, uh, you know, observer, observe, process of observation set up. Rather, it's that the, the reality has kind of woken up to itself through the instrumentality of an individual mind-body system. And if, if that is the case, but, but that it seems to me that, that if Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad, or whatever, they all got into room, to a room together and had a chat, they would concur. That, oh, yeah, we're all experiencing the same thing, just different languages and different you know, ways of explaining it. Well, actually, it's, there are some differences in terms of how we experience it. For example... 
if you experience it as all middle path, that's different from viewing it as the, the great self in, in the in, like the Brahman in, in in Hinduism. You experience it differently, but ultimately it's all the same. But we can't get beyond our, our descriptions and our perspectivism. So Interesting. It seems, it seems a little different in how we experience it. Yeah. So that's the way I look at it. And so the path you have been on might color the nature of your experience when you reach the culmination, the termination of that path. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So, for example, another important difference is whether the path is in, un, 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 unfolding in an impersonal way, but still brilliantly awake, or whether the path is more relational-based, like a god. Mm. Another way I've heard it explained is that um, different people have different constitutions. And so, so some people might experience, you know, the, the absolute as vastness and others more as bliss and, uh, you know, just different qualities according to their prakriti or their, you know, their constitutional makeup. According to their capacity, we'd say. Capacity, yeah. That's true. Uh-huh. But ultimately, there is an ultimate reality that goes beyond all those differences in experience. Right. And that's all the same. So it's the same but different, both the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And obviously another distinction is some people are more devotional and some more intellectual and some more just sort of activity-oriented and so on. So they're all going to tap into... Do, I'm sorry, go ahead. more to do with capacity. Right, right. It's more to do with the student rather than the, the nature of ultimate reality. Yeah. Although I imagine given that everything we've just said... Um, despite the different flavors of realization of the ultimate reality, you, if you had a, a whole group of people who had aligned with that, who had tapped into that, they'd get along, you know? <laughs> they wouldn't be killing each other over doctrinal differences or anything. Well, the Tibetans are notorious for debating their, their traditions and not getting along. Really? It's only 200 years ago that the Soga Rume movement, non-sectarian movement, came up. Mm -hmm. Starting with John von Trontrol, and what he did was he did something very unusual. He did a thing called the Dandaksu, which is 12 volumes. And in the 12 volumes, he, according to the level of practice, he, he, he selected the best meditations across traditions and sect and school of thought. It's never been done before. So there's a joke about the Tibetans that they're so competitive, fiercely competitive, that they would have killed each other off years ago without the Dharma. The only reason why they survived is because they had the teachings. But it's, it's only recently that the, the, the Rime movement happened, what we call a non-sectarian movement. I'm, I'm strongly Rime, so we take the best practices for every level of practice, according to the whole tradition. That's great. Yeah, I mean, in Indian traditions, there's plenty of debate. Also, Shankara used to go around debating people who had different views, and the tradition was actually, if, if you lost the debate, you had to become the other guy's disciple. I don't know if they do that in the Tibetan thing. Yeah, this, this is a great debate tradition. I actually, the other night, I, was, I asked Swami Sarva Priyananda about this thing of the six systems of Indian philosophy, which modern scholars often regard as being um, competitive with one another and contradictory. And, and he, he said, no, actually, they're complementary. They just pertain to different levels of spiritual development and different sort of facets of understanding of things. Um, so I wonder if, you know, you mentioned well, different perspectives. Different perspectives, yeah. Um, which is like, you know, the blind men fe feeling the elephant thing. They're, everybody's perspective is true. It's, it's just not the all-inclusive totality of the, of the thing. That's what I was saying about same and different before. Yeah, yeah. Um, so these, these Tibetans fighting with one another uh, over their different perspectives, I, I wonder if perhaps they were not fully enlightened people, and therefore they had that narrowness that characterizes Western Christian sects, for instance, where each one thinks it's the best. Well, we have to remember that the Tibetan tradition is strongly monastic. And in all honesty, the monastics are not the best meditators. They have a comfortable lifestyle. They do a lot of prayers during the day. They don't, don't spend most of the time meditating. The real tradition, the living tradition, is the cave and hermitage yogis, the ones who go on long retreats. Those are the ones that preserve the more advanced teachings. It's always been the cave and hermitage tradition. That's the one that's dying out now. 
So they're learning, they're many monks, but they don't assume they assume because they, they, they're a monk. They, they're advanced and they're, they're advanced yogis, but most of them aren't. Most of them are sort of mid-level yogis. Mm. Yeah, I know you've done a lot of work and are doing a, a lot of work still um, to help preserve these traditions that are dying out. And, uh, you know, perhaps you could talk about that a little bit. You, I didn't really mention it at the beginning, but you, you I don't know to what extent you've mastered the, these languages, but you, you have studied Sanskrit, Pali, and Tibetan very, very Tibetan. deeply. And I think you're quite fluent in at least Tibetan, maybe Pali also. Well, I don't speak Tibetan. The spoken language is different from the classical written language. So I can translate text well, but I can't speak it in daily because I don't hear it enough. Uh-huh. Sure. But anyway, yeah, you're, you're working to preserve a lot of these teachings that are in yes. danger of dying. Yes, we have eight books of two teachings that we've done in the last four years to preserve these teachings. It's amazing you can do all this. I mean, you've, you've written, what, 14 books or something? 23. 23 books. And golly, I mean, you, you've, you've done so many things in your life. I, went, I You know, when I, I mean, obviously you're a smart guy, but somehow when I have been thinking about that, uh, I've been thinking, you know, I bet you he would attribute that to a great degree to his actual spiritual practice. It's made him more productive. Yes, the concentration training helped a lot. Yeah, yeah. Because when I sit down, I don't waste time, I just get it done. Like writing. Yeah, they say that the average person, if if they're working on something and an email comes in or something, it takes like 20 minutes to get back to, you know, the focus that they had. And obviously, interruptions often come in more frequently than t every 20 minutes. So pe some people are just bouncing around all day long from one thing to another. There's never an interruption. It's a continuous awakened awareness of everything. Mm. Do you find that um, I, that in more trying circumstances, uh, such as let's say the chaos of travel or something like that, it's um, not only not compromised, but is actually perhaps enhanced because the the contrast is clearer between the the awakened awareness and the chaos of of Logan Airport or something. Um, that means I have to put more intention to practice better at those times. It comes down to intention. Hmm. So in other words, you ramp up your intention a little bit if you're in a chaotic circumstance? Yes. Okay. All it takes. Yeah. Um, here's a question that came in from Imam in Missouri. Is non-doing a practice or a state of being? If it's a practice, how effective is it, and how do you do it when faced in a situation where you need to make a decision? Not doing is a precursor to awakening. It's called, in Mahamudra, it's called non-meditation meditation. meditation. In Dzogchen, it's called the great state of non-doing. And the way you do that is by having automatic emptiness. And any time there's a residual tend to, tend to do anything, to focus attention on something, to change something around, to engage in some meditation strategy, and immediately as it arises, it's empty upon arising. So automatic emptiness becomes a clearing agent for all types of doing. You can't do anything to get to non-doing. Yeah, that you would see? be a contradiction in terms. So, but if you have a strong automatic emptiness, it's a clearing agent for all types of doing, uh -huh. and for all residual conceptualization. And that's setting up what we call a natural state of the mind, which is the precursor to awakening. Yeah, that, that brings me back to what we talked about earlier in terms of concentration versus effortlessness. If, I've always thought of concentration as a sort of introduction of effort, which it is actually, and um, it seems counterproductive if the whole point is to settle into a, a, a silent state. It's kind of like if you had a pan of water and it had ripples in it, you try to stop the ripples by pushing on the ripples, you just create more ripples. No. Concentration takes a lot of work at the beginning with intensifying, as I said earlier. Yeah. And by concentrating, you eventually stop all the thought and elaboration from happening. You prevent mind wandering from happening. And the mind stays focused and it becomes serviceable. Once you make it serviceable, you can separate that from the concentration training itself. 
and you hold the view. Each meditation has a certain view that you take, a certain perspective. The view is the meditation, and you learn to hold the view in an absolutely stable way. So, for example, you hold the view of, of emptiness arising every moment by moment by moment. So that you have automatic emptiness, and that clears away residual conceptual thought. It clears away all types of doing. And it sets up the mind in a natural state so that you can cross over from ordinary mind to awakened mind. But the original question, it was about doing in everyday life. It's right. not about that. It's about in, in your deep concentration, in your deep practice, you focus on non-doing. The state establishes a state of non-doing. Yeah. So awareness doesn't something you can make happen. It happens to itself. It shows itself to itself by itself if you set up the right conditions. Mind is programmed for awakening. It, it, we all have the seed of enlightened intention. The path wants to show itself to itself. You just set it up and get out of the way. So the pith instructions that give you all the secret instructions for how to set up the mind the right way so you can shift from the ordinary mind to awakened mind. You need to get those from the teacher. In the right state of mind, you can get the instructions in the right way so that you can set up the great meditation of non-meditation or the great state of non-doing. And then you can set up the view in the right way that you can cross over from the ordinary mind to awakened mind. That's how this works. It doesn't have anything to do about daily life. It doesn't mean doing anything non, non, in, in daily life. You don't. It, conduct doesn't matter in daily life. Off the pillow. Mm. The question originally was about uh, doing everyday life. Yeah. Man. So you and I are talking right now, and um, are you? doing anything to hold the view or maintain any sort of state of awareness or anything? Or is it just kind of a natural, spontaneous condition after all of your decades of practice and you don't really have to sort of attend to it? It just, all, it's built all in. All it requires is an intention, intention to hold it. Yeah. It's like setting a thermostat with an intention. Set it and let it go. Set it and let it go. Right. And do you actually have to continue to reset that intention like every day when you get up in the morning or something? Or after a while, does it just become second nature? Not much. Pretty much you couldn't go away if you wanted it to, probably, at this point. Oops. <laughs> it doesn't go away. <laughs> no. I mean, even in terms of the neurophysiology, it must be that after all these years of practice, you're whole brain yeah. structure has, yeah. has changed and yeah. you're not just that's just not going to go away on like just like uh, that the neuroscience is learned connect, 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 connectivity so you learn certain pathways and they open up automatically yeah and they found that like certain areas of the brain get thicker and stuff the frontal cortex or whatever in meditators so this stuff you know it gets seems let me get it gets stabilized by virtue of a a deep transformation Changing of the nervous system. That's that's correct. It starts with no, no increased neuro, neuro connectivity, and then it changes the brain structure. So he's setting down new pathways. Yeah, I've interviewed Rick Hansen a couple of times. He talks a lot about neuroplasticity. Um, I, I lifted this paragraph from one of your websites. Let's, and maybe you want to talk about it a little bit. It's. Um, pointing out the great way combines a strong grounding in the Western scientific study of the con contemplative experience integrated with the ancient Indian and Tibetan spiritual traditions and the wisdom of their direct transmission, transmission lineages. This provides Westerners of all levels with simple, profound, and clear access to the deepest spiritual traditions. Have we covered that adequately, or is there something more you want to say about that? No, that's we covered adequately. Okay, and that's that's it's a certain style. I, I, I'll tell you a story about that. Okay, I, I taught with concentration with Den Malocho and his lamas. He's an abbot of Namgyal Monastery, in Damsala, the Dalai Lama's monastery. We taught together for 15 years, and I was once visiting the Dalai Lama, and he said, "Stick around. There's somebody I want you to meet." And he said he knows how to teach Westerners. Some of our old lineage of 84 wandering masters. He sat down with me and he said, take your meditation posture, I'm going to show you something. For the next six hours, he went through the details of all eight stages of inner fire practice using the central channel. And then he said, I want you to promise not to teach this and not to practice it on your own. I said, why are you showing me this? And he said, I'm showing you a style of teaching and I want to teach you other things this way. So I never heard anything quite like it. So 
we started teaching this well, pointing out style. We start it, 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 for every level of practice is an overview to what you're going to accomplish. We give a detailed explanation of that. Then it's not all the meditations are guided. We walk you through it step by step. This is what are called pith instructions, which are direct, immediate instructions for how to take a certain view. And then immediately after you talk about it, so you don't create bad habits. So we can keep you on track with where we're going to take you. So in a, in a week's course, you can walk the people through the very beginning of practice up to a taste of awakening. With the, if the students are motivated and they don't get in their own way, about one out of three people will get a taste of awakening within the week. So this is something you taught with that guy for a while, but then he died, and now you teach it as part of your retreats and all? Yes, that's true. But our great tradition of growth is psychotherapy in the West, which is strongly relational-based. And the Dalai Lama realized that this we really needed a relational-based way of teaching. So you use the teaching relationship to give the pith instructions and to explain it in great detail and to keep people on track so they don't make mistakes with the practice and develop bad habits. So that's what's unique about this pointing out style. And the Dalai Lama's gift to the West, he thought it was something that Westerners could use and it worked for Westerners. And a taste of awakening would be what? Shifting to the, to the boundless, unbounded wholeness of brilliantly lucid, awakened awareness love. For how long? Even a glimpse or? Even a glimpse of that, it changes everything in your life. Yeah, yeah. So about a third of the people get that within a week. Yeah. Okay, good. That's great. Including on your online programs, not just the in-person ones, pre-pandemic. Well, we're trying to do it. We're trying to do, do Zoom courses now. And we found the statistics about the same. That's great. I bet you a lot of people will be doing things online even when the pandemic is gone, you know, just because they've discovered that it's, you know, could be just as good and doesn't involve all the travel and expense and stuff. That's true. Yeah. Um, okay, we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, now, you know, it's been about, when, when, we're, when we're recording this, it's been um, what, about two or three days since uh, there was an attempted coup in Washington, D.C., um, and it was fueled in large part by the fact that large numbers of people have fallen into conspiracy theory thinking and have lost the ability to s discriminate, in my opinion, between reliable sources of, of information and unreliable ones and have shown themselves to be extremely impressionable. So anybody can say just about anything on YouTube or somewhere on the internet and you know, a person will say, well, that makes sense to me. And it, it sort of builds a worldview that gets, in my opinion, farther and farther detached from reality and obviously has now lethal consequences. Um, so I've been a bit fascinated with this whole topic this year because it's been growing and growing and um, I did a, an interview a few weeks ago with the, uh, uh, three guys who do a podcast called Conspirituality, which is a play on words that conspiritual, conspiracy theories have kind of infiltrated uh, spiritual communities and, and people, and large numbers of people have bought into them and have ended up getting quite far right wing in their political orientation and dismissing any kind of mainstream media information that, you know. And so, I don't know, I'm just, you've obviously been observing this too, and with your whole background in, in Tibetan Buddhism, I wonder if you have any observations about what's been going on and any advice for people. Well, it's, it's, it's the same kind of thing we see in cults. I've done a lot of work with exit counseling and people in cults. And then served as an expert witness for them in courts on a number of occasions as a forensic psychologist. So we know a lot about how people can get extreme ideas and get caught up in those ideas. Ultimately, it's the leadership that's responsible for creating that stuff. So I hold Trump responsible for his inciting the violence. And of course, he's had a fertile field in terms of many people who are susceptible to indoctrination. That's true. But he's still a leader, and he has certain responsibilities, code of conduct as a leader. And he's oh, not, I agree. I agree. He's not done that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, since there is a high incidence of people who've been on spiritual paths uh, falling into, falling 
being susceptible to this kind of indoctrination. Is there anything you would advise that people could do as part of a spiritual practice in order to, to strengthen their their powers of discernment or discrimination or separating truth from falsehood? Don't isolate themselves to a certain group. Get a diversity of opinions. Mm. That's what prevents people from getting caught, caught up in cults. When they get an outside opinion, it's different from what they're caught up in. It's the most important thing. Yeah. I actually, um, I interviewed um, Dan Harris of ABC News a few years ago. He he wrote a book called 10% Happier about his meditation practice and, and all. And I, I actually emailed him recently and said, why don't you set up on television debates between, you know, a prominent conspiracy theorist or, and, a, you know, a doctor or someone else who is qualified to, you know, parry with this person, debate with this person, and, um, you know, let them express their conspiracy views, if you want to call use that derogatory term, and, but then let the other guy, you know, um, respond to it. And he, he kind of say, I don't know. So, so, so far, I haven't seen that happening, but it would be interesting because otherwise, like, like you say, people silo themselves, they isolate themselves within a certain, um, you know, group. And um, that, that um, Netflix movie, the, what was it called? The, the Social Dilemma uh, explains how this is actually monetized by, by right. face, Facebook and so on. And it, they get the, the polarities, the, the extremity, the, you know, become more and more extreme, and society becomes more and more fragmented. Yes. I think it happens that way. One of the fields I work in, so a psychologist is an expert on suggestibility effects. So we watch how people develop these limiting beliefs, and, and they get caught up in them completely. That's what happens in all, all cults. Yeah. So your primary recommendation is just to mix it up a bit, to expose yourself to other viewpoints and so on. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that's what happens in exit counseling from cults. The exit counselor sits there and talks about the inconsistencies with their belief systems and gently points them out so they start to see the co contradictions in them. You yeah. don't see it first. And it works both ways. I mean... You know, I've actually spent time reading the website of the Flat Earth people <laughs> uh, just to kind of say, what makes them tick? You know, I'm, I'm not afraid to look at their what they're saying, but it's it's very easy to debunk this kind of stuff because there's so much evidence to the contrary. So, you know. Yeah, but with social media, we've created a culture by which you don't evaluate evidence anymore. As a forensic psychologist, I'm trained to evaluate evidence. Yeah. We don't do that anymore. The general culture just accepts everything at face value. And social media made that worse. Does that concern you about where we're going as a, as a society? It does concern me a lot. Yeah. But the country split right in half. We have half of the people who are in extreme views and the other half of the people who are sane. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's divided right down the middle. I know. The reason I'm laughing is that I've had people who have what you and I would call extreme views use that very same wording to characterize my perspective, you know. Um, it, it's just so ironic. That, um, I, I really, there are some efforts, actually, by people to get together, you know, liberals and conservatives and so on in the same room and have them discuss hot-button issues and try to see each other's point of view and you know kind of well we have to recreate dialogue bipartisan dialogue yeah so people learn diversity of views we're not doing that anymore people live in their own world and they get more and more isolated that's that's, that's where the danger comes yeah well maybe in light of this week's events there'll be a renewed effort to to get that going you know because obviously we've seen how bad it can, we haven't seen how bad it can get. We, we, it could probably get a lot worse, but we've sort of ha hadn't gotten a taste of what it can be like when there's this kind of fragmentation. Well, Biden has a history of being strongly bipartisan, so I hope for that. Yeah, yeah. And we can return to that. I uh, hope so. Well, I don't know if we want to end on this note, but um, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we um, wrap it up? Yeah, I teach a course at Harvard Medical School on, on leadership and performance excellence. 
And what we're trying to do is talk about realized leaders. Trump is not involved at all as a realized leader. He's the, he's the negative opposite of that. He's limited in this as a human being. He should never be put in a position of that kind of power. Because he, he's, he's showing he can't handle it. Yeah, I've seen situations where like various groups of psychiatrists have put full page ads in the New York Times or something describing, you know, his condition diagnosed from afar, obviously. But um, I'm not going to do that. Pardon? I'm not going to do that. I'm just saying that he's limited as a human being. He's shown that over and over again. You don't need psychology for that. Common sense will tell you that. Well, and we're all limited, but we're not all running for president. I don't think I'd do a very good job at it. <laughs> well, maybe we'll learn from this too, you know? Um, you know, my wife keeps saying there should be some kind of test before you get to run for president, some psychological test, some educational aptitude test or something. It all comes down to what model of leadership we have. Of all leaders, are the best leaders in all, throughout history, realized leaders. I'd like to go back to that myself. Can you name a, 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 a few realized leaders who have been realized leaders? Throughout history, Ashoka. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. It's a good example of that. The ones that are responsible for ancient Greece. Right. King Janaka, it was said, in ancient India. Yeah. Those are good, good examples. Modern leaders, Gorbachev. Interesting. He lived his vision. Whether you agree with it or not, he lived his vision of per perestroika. Yeah. He had a clear model of where he envisioned and where he wanted to decide to go, and he brought it there. He cost himself his job in the process, but he did it. He lived out his leadership role. Well, okay. Um, let's hope that we, within our lifetimes, um, see more enlightened leadership um, rising, you know, to, to, to guide us. It seems to me that the leaders we elect depend the, to a great degree upon the collective consciousness of the people, and yet it can really lurch back and forth quite a bit between administrations. So perhaps each, you know, each four or eight years, we just kind of, a different faction of the collective consciousness gets to express itself. So I think ultimately even you could put Jesus Christ in the Oval Office and if there's still a lot of crazy people, I mean, I've heard you talk, we haven't gotten onto this, but I've heard you talk about how, tr how tr severely traumatized so many people are and you've worked a lot with that. If we have a traumatized populace, you know, deeply attached and blind, you know, spiritually blind populace, you, you could, you know, put the most enlightened leader in the world up there and I wonder how much he could accomplish. Thomas Jefferson said it takes enlightened population to be a good democracy. There you go, yeah. Which is why it's important for education to be a priority, and, and yet certain yes. politicians always seem to want to undercut it, which is concerning. Yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah. It does require good education, and it requires dialogue with each other. Yeah. So we get us exposed and appreciate diversity. Mm -hmm. Are you optimistic? I mean, I have some I have some friends who say, well, we're all, there's going to be a nuclear war, or climate change is going to get so bad that everybody's going to die. And I, I keep this, I think we appreciate this, the effects of suggestibility. Uh -huh. I participated in a think tank on three days in, in UMass, yeah, it's UMass Boston, in the early 1990s, and they had it was a political think tank. They had all the campaign managers for the great presidential elections for the first 20 years previous 20 years, mm -hmm. and the Republicans presented their research findings. They found that if they put a certain spin on things, and they did three things, they talked about that their candidate would make the world safe internationally, make the economy safe, and make the streets safe, domestically, economically, and internationally. And the other candidate was, would evoke fear Instability, in, in, in international instability, domestic instability, and economic instability. If you send out that message, it doesn't have to be accurate. Then you can catch it somewhere between up to 12% of the vote. Mm. And that's usually enough to win. 
and the Republicans presented that at their convention, and they, it was working. And the Democrats were clueless about it and say, well, why would you want to do that? Don't you, don't the, the issues matter? Don't you want to be honest? Yeah. And, and the Republicans were saying, no, all that matters is you win, that you can do what you want. Mm. And they couldn't talk with each other for three days. Huh. And now we've made that international by bringing in Russia and Ukraine, people like that. We can sway an election. It's all about sound bites. I think the general public needs to be educated in terms of what the influence of this suggestive influence can be. Because right now it's done intentionally on people. And we need to be aware of that. Because it has a negative effect on everybody. And it does sway elections. Remember Trump came from, his popularity came from reality TV? Yeah. So we are bound by suggestive influence. I think we need to educate people more about the effects of that, the negative effects of that, and how we're all vulnerable. We want to preserve our democracy. That's in my opinion as a psychologist. Yeah. And that suggestibility effects. And the same thing about cults is the same thing of just not suggesting, not not looking at the evidence and, and evaluating the, critically the evidence, just accepting everything. It's all about sound bites. Mm. I want to exploit that. And it's it's it's. Uh insidious too if that's the right word it's it's you know you incrementally shift into deeper and deeper delusion or shift out of it into greater and greater clarity you you don't shift from deep delusion to perfect clarity in a in a, in a heartbeat so mm -hmm. you really have to kind of keep steering the course of your life in the right direction if you are serious about well and that requires some sort of medical awareness of what you're thinking mm -hmm. what you're doing yeah. It requires dialogue with other people who have diversity. So you're exposed to a variety of points of view and you learn to respect them rather than polarize them. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I, I try to facilitate that kind of stuff myself. I, I have a, a, fr a friend who is very much, you know, COVID is a hoax, vaccines are terrible, this kind of thing. And then I have this other friend who... Uh, it makes YouTube videos. He's a he's a molecular biologist. Makes YouTube videos debunking all these kinds of ideas, and I, I, I'm trying to arrange a conversation between the two of them, which they might record online. Uh, but just like I said, that thing I proposed to Dan Harris, and actually, uh, they, I think they just agreed to it. So <laughs> that that kind of stuff, I think, is is needed more and more, so that you just don't live in your own little vacuum bubble. I think that's true. I agree with that. Yeah. Alrighty, I've taken enough of your time, but I've I've really enjoyed this conversation, Dan, and um, I've really enjoyed the the past week. I was we've had some snow here, so I've been out cross country skiing and listening to you every day, uh, <laughs> you know, on my iPod. Uh, so it's I I really admire the life you've been living and everything you've accomplished. It's it's tremendous, and uh, you know. Good, sh good, good going. Um, you've, re you've really done uh, a lot with your life and are continuing to do a lot. So um, I'll set up a page on, on batgap.com for this interview and we'll link to everything that you want me to. I think I, I'll, I'll email you because I think that, that last thing you said about signing up for, for retreats, what, what was that one called? Pointingoutway.org. Pointingoutway.org. Okay, I'll make sure to link to that one. Way. Pointing out way. way pointingoutway.org. I'll make sure to link to that one too. So obviously people can uh, can get in touch and um, participate in what you have to offer. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate your kindness. Oh, it's it's, a, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate your kindness and, and the, the time you've, you've given us today. So for those who've been listening or watching, um, obviously, you know, this is an ongoing series. Um, and uh, if you'd like to see which guests are scheduled, uh, go to the upcoming interviews page on batgap.com and you'll see what we have planned. Um, but I've been doing this for 11 years now and totally enjoy it. And uh, I don't see any end in sight. I hope to keep doing it as long as I can. Um, so thanks for listening or watching and we'll see you for the next one. Uh, thanks again so much, Dan. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.